with Rami G. Corey to discuss the U.S. Um, and Afghanistan and the Middle East. So I'm going to do a quick bio, if that's okay with you. All right. Yep. So Rami G. Corey is Director of Global Engagement um, at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. Um, he also serves as Professor of Journalism and Journalist in Residence and Senior Fellow at AUB at San Faris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs, which he founded and directed for eight years. Um, he is also the international, international syndicated political columnist and book author and a non-resident senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, before moving full-time into academia, he had a 50-year-long career in journalism in the Middle East, excluding, including uh, executive director of Beirut-based Daily Star News and editor-in-chief. Um, so with that being said, uh, Mr. Corey, the floor is yours. And again, welcome to the attendees online and everybody in person. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation from the Institute and Emmanuel College. Uh, thank you to Petros and, uh, and the crew, Leila, Maria, Natalie. Um, I, uh, I'm glad to be with you and I hope that we have a mutually useful and, and satisfying and educational exchange of views and uh, ideas. Um, the, the topic that I was asked to speak about, which is uh, the U.S. and the Middle East after Afghanistan or after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, is a little bit complex because the U.S. Has, has pulled its military out of Afghanistan, but it is still very much a presence uh, in and around the country in different ways. Uh, and the Middle East, after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, is in a condition of tremendous flux and change um, and evolution. Um, and the short answer to the question of, you know, what is, the, what is happening to the U.S in the Middle East after Afghanistan, the answer is it's the same as what was happening before Afghanistan or during Afghanistan, the U.S. in Afghanistan, but it's just happening at a much faster pace now that the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, I believe, <clears throat> will be seen <clears throat> in retrospect as one of uh, the uh, uh, turning points in the history of the modern Middle East, even though Afghanistan is South Asia, but that they're very closely linked together in terms of the American foreign policy perceptions and policies, especially the military policy, especially the, uh, the war against terror policies. Um, so they're really very closely linked together and, and should be seen as one unit in terms of policy analysis and, and political and military action. But I think if you go back over the last century of, of statehood and the in the Arab Middle East region, um, it's a little bit different in South Asia, uh, but you have essentially four important phases and every 20, 30 years is a, a, a big change that happens. The first was 1920 to 1948, um, and then in 48, Israel was created and, and Arab military leaders started taking power, and that was one phase. And then from 48 to 1967 was a phase in the Middle East um, state building and some wars. And then after the 67 war, if you had a period from 1967 till the end of the, uh, till the Cold War ended in 1990 or so, 89, 90, that was a distinct period of, um, of let's say, developments, positive and negative. And after 1990, <clears throat> uh, from 1990 until today, we've had a distinct phase in the history of the region uh, both the Middle East and Afghanistan linked together in, uh, in many ways. Uh, and now I believe we're seeing the fifth broad period of historical transformation in uh, the Middle East. Uh, and this is very closely linked to American policy and the American military presence in the region and uh, the, the impact of the United States uh, in the region. I think when you ask about the U.S. and the Middle East, <clears throat> um, you really have to ask several different questions and then try to put them together. One is, what is the U.S. perception? What, what does the U.S. see in the Middle East that is important to it? What is strategically important? What does it see as important for its national well-being, whether physical or economic or whatever, strategic? And therefore, what does the U.S. feel it needs to do? Uh, that's one question. The second question is, <clears throat> 
what about the other people in the Middle East, the Arab countries, Israel, Turkey, uh, Iran, and then of course, Afghanistan, um, Pakistan. Um, so the, these are a separate set of uh, smaller countries and we have to look at their interests. The third one is the uh, other big powers, mostly Russia and China. Uh, what are their interests in the region? What are their policies pursuing? How are they dealing with the uh, big American presence that's been there for 20, 30 years, and now possibly a smaller, reduced American military presence, which I think we're likely uh, to see. Um, and then the fourth uh, element, which is almost never discussed around the world, and which is one of the great black holes in American media coverage of the Middle East, and I would say of Afghanistan recently, with a very few exceptions, uh, the great, the big question is, well, what about the ordinary people of the Middle East? You know, there's, there's something like a billion people between the Arabs and the Iranians and Turks and um, Afghanis and Pakistanis. There's a, there's a huge population in that region. And we never, for just ordinary people like you and like me, and uh, some of them are professionals, some are taxi drivers, some are farmers, some are smugglers. Some are bankers, some are high-tech uh, billionaires. What do these ordinary people feel? What are their interests? What are their perceptions? What do they think about all these big powers fighting each other over them? Um, and um, th that, that view of the ordinary people remains a black hole, a missing element um, in much of the international perception and analysis of the um, region, and therefore in the policies that foreign powers conduct, not only foreign powers, but many of the political leaders in the Middle East, especially in the Arab world, but also in Israel, Turkey, Iran, um, Afghanistan, other places, the leaderships often ignore their own people as well. And that's why this region is so violent, so full of sectarian strife, tension, civil war, secessionist movements, armed non-state actors, refugee flows, um, and, and a lot of illegal drug uh, smuggling and, uh, and um, uh, human trafficking and illegal migration and all kinds of uh, other things. But these, you have to look at all these factors uh, together. I think the U.S. perception of the Middle East for the last 50 or 60 years, certainly in my lifetime, has broadly focused on a few factors. One is um, the, the national defense of the U.S., to protect the U.S., physically. Now, the Middle East was never a threat to the U.S., like Russia may have been, or the Soviet Union. Uh, but then when you had terrorism after the 9-11 attacks, uh, this became an important element, the physical protection of, of the U.S. The second um, issue that the U.S. looks at is protecting Israel. Israel is a very close ally of the U.S., and that's a whole separate argument, a discussion that we can have, but it is they're very close strategically and the U.S. supports Israel almost without question. Um, and uh, the U.S. will do virtually anything Israel wants it to do to protect Israel, even though Israel is not really threatened anymore by any Arab uh, powers in any serious way. Um, but the, um, the, the link to Israel is very important to the U.S. and the U.S. wants to make sure that Israel um, is safe. To the extent that the U.S. Congress a few years ago passed a resolution, which the president signed, guaranteeing, by U.S. law, guaranteeing that Israel must remain militarily stronger than any combination of uh, adversaries around it, Arabs, Iranians, Turks, whatever, whoever might one day gang up on it, uh, if that ever happens. Israel must, must be stronger than any combination of these potential foes. And this is guaranteed by the, by the law of the United States. It's quite an extraordinary situation. It's the only place in the world where the U.S. guarantees the superiority of one actor in a region where there are competing um, uh, views and, uh, and, and states. Uh, so, that's, so Israel is, uh, is another important element. The flow of oil has always been important, oil and gas. Uh, it's less important to the U.S. now because the U.S. imports very little from the Middle East, but it's important for the whole world economy. So the U.S. is still focused on making sure that the, that the oil flows, even though the threat of oil not flowing is almost non-existent because none of the Middle East states want to stop the flow of oil because they rely so much on, their oil producers rely for their national economies on 
oil to a huge extent. Uh, so this idea that people will threaten the flow of oil um, is, is a slightly hysterical in the American mind, but it's a possibility, I suppose, uh, it could happen. And therefore, the U.S. wants to, to make sure that oil flows. The U.S. is interested in commerce, selling arms, selling uh, commercial goods, uh, sells a lot of arms. Um, and um, that's, a, that's an interest that the U.S. has. It also wants to protect its allies, it calls its allies, um, mostly Arab autocratic uh, states run by individuals or by families. Um, if they're monarchies, or even if they're not monarchies, they're still run by families. Um, and uh, these are uh, autocratic, non-democratic states in which the uh, political ruling elite is usually anchored in the military that took power in the country, like in Syria or years ago in Libya and Iraq and in Tunisia and Egypt still today, the army controls the country. Um, and these so-called allies of the U.S. are among the most uh, atrocious human rights abusers in the whole world, but they're still close allies of the U.S. for reasons that the U.S. government one day will have to uh, explain, even though people raise this all the time. Uh, but this is a fact that the U.S. Uh, factors into its Middle East policies. Um, and finally, I think there is the question of non-proliferation um, of nuclear uh, material or nuclear weapons. Even though Israel has probably a couple of hundred nuclear weapons, the U.S. doesn't want anybody else in the region to have uh, nuclear weapons and, and works actively to prevent that. And the policies towards Iran are the most uh, profound manifestation of that policy. Um, the, the, the great irony is that the more the U.S. puts pressure on Iran, certainly under the Trump administration, um, <clears throat> and they, they broke, they pulled out of the uh, JCPOA, the, uh, mil the, U the agreement between the U.S. and Iran on nuclear issues and sanctions. When the Trump people pulled out of that, the irony is that Iran resumed its nuclear industry development. They weren't necessarily making a nuclear weapon, but they kept def refining their nuclear capabilities. Um, and of course, there's a big argument, does Iran want to make a nuclear weapon? And nobody has yet given a definitive answer to that. But certainly, Iran's nuclear capabilities are developing. Um, and most of them are monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, which is the global UN body that monitors these things. The, the, the strictest monitoring of the nuclear industry anywhere in the world is in Iran. Um, and therefore, uh, the U.S. wants to make sure that Iran or other people don't get uh, nuclear weapons. So if you take all of those interests together, um, they, that makes quite a set of um, uh, activities, that most of which sound pretty reasonable. Uh, but the reality is that the U.S. approach to the Middle East Going back, I would say, since right after the 67 war, and I'm old enough to remember I was in college in 1967, and how the U.S. suddenly uh, got much closer to Israel and provided huge amounts of military aid and technology and, and continues to do so today, um, that the U.S. policies in the Middle East have heavily been defined by military presence or military activities. Uh, or assisting others, like especially assisting Israel, um, but also some Arab countries. Jordan, for instance, gets a lot of military assistance from the U.S., and other Arab countries do too. Uh, the emphasis on military policies as a means to achieving the political goals that I just mentioned um, ha has not worked very well. Uh, and what I mean by that is that while you can argue that there have not been any more major attacks against the U.S. by terrorists since 9-11, uh, partly because of the uh, American um, counterterrorism uh, response and the war on terror, uh, the fact is that this has come at such a massive price for the integrity and the stability and the coherence and the development and the well-being of many of these Arab countries and Asian countries because the incredible increase in support for autocratic regimes, military and economic and security support, has, has vastly increased the uh, pressure that governments in the Middle East put on their own people and, and increased the denial of rights uh, and uh, opportunities that people uh, can enjoy as, as ordinary citizens. This has also led to great amounts of corruption uh, 
And therefore, in the last 30 years or so, there has been a quite a significant and steady um, trend in which most of the Arab economies, and I'm talking about the Arab world now, uh, most of the Arab economies have either stagnated or declined in terms of the well-being of ordinary households. If you take away the few oil producing countries like Kuwait and UAE and Qatar and Saudi Arabia and others, uh, their reliance on oil makes them a whole separate um, reality. But if you take all the other countries, there's about 430 million Arabs now, about 270 million of them or something, 370 million or something like that, um, do not rely on oil and therefore they have um, economies that depend a lot on foreign aid and other things. Most of these have floundered in the last 20 or 30 years in terms of the well-being of the average family in their home and in their community. If you read the accounts of, that governments give about their GDPs, their gross domestic product is growing and their exports are growing and foreign direct investment is increasing, they make it sound rosy. When you look at the data that has been coming out of surveys, international and local surveys in the last 15 years, the reality is that around 70-75% of the people in the entire Arab world are poor and vulnerable. Um, about 75 to 80% cannot meet their basic monthly needs of, of food, uh, uh, housing, medical care, education, etc. Um, there is a significant problem in pauperization. The Arab region is a region of paupers, poor people, uh, and they also have no political rights. The combination of those two things, a pauperized, powerless citizenry held in check by a autocratic uh, government that relies heavily on foreign, often American support, but sometimes Russian, sometimes Iranian, sometimes other support, but heavily American, uh, this has created massive tensions um, and, and fragmentation within the Arab uh, countries. And this is one of the reasons why we see so many conflicts and sectarian war fights and uh, groups breaking away and trying to create their own uh, countries. So this, this history of American involvement in the Middle East, uh, in Afghanistan and in the, in the Arab region, with a strong military accent to it, has really created uh, big problems um, and, and has perhaps uh, shielded the US from any more 9-11 attacks, but it has driven most of the Arab region into uh, terrible conditions of economic degradation, political stress, social tension, uh, sectarian uh, conflicts, and it opened the floodgates once the US went into Afghanistan, and once the U.S. went into Iraq after that, um, it opened the floodgates to anybody in the region or outside who wanted to bring in their military, bring in the boys and sometimes girls, mostly boys, bring in the boys and let them fight. Try out your new weapons. You, know, you want to try out new surveillance systems. You want to try out new aerial bombardment techniques, whatever. You got a new bomb you want to test it. Come to the Arab world. It was open, uh, or Afghanistan, an open season. And this is one of the consequences that we still suffer from today uh, because we've got not only global powers like the US, uh, Russia, uh, uh, England, France, actively involved in military fighting in Yemen and in Syria and Iraq and other places. Uh, and of course, many were involved in NATO and Afghanistan, but you've also got now regional powers like Turkey, uh, Iran, Israel, others uh, and, and some new regional powers who want to be regional military actors like the United Arab Emirates, um, the Saudis to some extent, the Egyptians a little bit, um, who are trying to play a role. But they're all trying to do the same thing the U.S. did on a smaller role, which is to use its military to try to achieve political gains. And I think the lesson of modern history since Vietnam is, is that it's very hard to do that. And it's actually pretty stupid to do that too. Uh, because in the end, you destroy the area where you're fighting and you create huge amounts of enemies and it takes two or three generations to overcome that. Uh, the U.S. and Vietnam, for instance, needed two or three generations to overcome the impact of its years of destruction in Vietnam and Cambodia until um, new generations came along and the U.S. got out of there and then they just started uh, 
becoming commercial partners more than anything else. So none of these things are permanent. They can all be changed. But, but this is real serious. Um, uh, uh, there's a real serious impact to when you send a couple hundred thousand troops to Iraq or to Afghanistan or to Vietnam or to other places. The Russians learned it in Afghanistan, the British learned it before that, and the Americans have just learned it now. The Americans also seem to be learning it in, a, in Iraq, probably in Syria. Uh, we'll see. The Israelis haven't learned it. They keep attacking Gaza, and every five, six years, a big war happens. They beat up a lot of Palestinians and kill them, and then they get out. And, uh, 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 and that doesn't solve anything, and, and the people that they're fighting uh, which is uh, Hamas mostly, uh, emerges from the round of battle stronger and five years later has more uh, capable missile technology and surveillance and communications, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the policy of militarism, whether carried out on a local level, like in the Middle East, um, the Egyptian government in Sinai similarly has, has not eradicated the um, rebels in Sinai, the ISIS linked or other groups who are challenging uh, and shooting at the Egyptian government. Um, you, you can't use military means to achieve political goals very easily. Sometimes it happens, but usually it doesn't. So the lesson of Afghanistan and the Middle East is that um, the U.S. has to, re I think, is starting to reconsider the fact that does it need, a, it has approximately a uh, hundred bases around the Middle East. The U.S. has around 800 military bases. 800 around the world. I mean, some of them are small, but they're, these are proper military bases uh, with different functions. Um, but there's about 100 of them all around the Middle East. Um, and there are about six to 7,000 American troops all across the Middle East and Arab countries and Turkey and, and Israel mostly. Uh, so after the pullout from Afghanistan, I think we're going to see several things. Uh, and what we're going to see is an acceleration of trends in the Middle East that had already been there before, but at a lower intensity. And they're now going to become uh, much more dynamic and maybe move a little bit uh, faster and maybe even have greater uh, consequences. The first thing is that most of the political powers in the region, whether they're big or small, whether they're local or foreign, so the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese, the Emiratis, the Jordanians, the, anybody you look at, the Turks, they're all in motion. Um, the, the perception that the U.S. is going to reduce its footprint in the Middle East, its physical presence, which I think is a correct perception, uh, because the Americans are reckless, but they're not totally stupid. They understand when a policy doesn't work, which they just understood in Afghanistan, and they get out and, and they justify it and, and politics goes on. And then two months later, people are talking about something else. That's how the world works. I've been watching this as a journalist in the region for 54 years now, since 1968, when I started my journalism work. Uh, and this is the reality of the world. None of these things last for a long time. Um, but the U.S. seems to be... Um, understanding that its policy didn't work in Afghanistan. At least its initial policy worked. It got rid of Al-Qaeda, broke up the Al-Qaeda training camps after the attacks in 2001. Uh, and then the U.S. should have gotten out and le left it for the Afghan government to, but it didn't, it stayed there. So that was, that was a big mistake. But the U.S. seems to be learning these lessons and, and is probably going to reevaluate its policies, including its military policies. There are small signs of this with the Biden administration, but not very significant ones, but there are small hints that in Yemen and uh, with the Saudis and Palestine, uh, in Iran, there may be small changes taking place, but we'll see how, how these develop. The important thing is that everybody is reconsidering their strategic uh, relationships and their short-term expedient relationships. So if you're a Jordan or a Turkey or, or a, a Yemen, well, Yemen's a bit of a problem because it's a war, but, or Egypt or Iran or any of these countries, they're all reconsidering now, uh, where should they form greater friendships and closer alliances? So traditional foes and traditional meaning going back maybe 15 years, 20 years, like um, for instance, 
Egypt and, and Turkey um, um, are slowly talking to each other. The Iranians and the Saudis and the Emiratis are slowly talking to each other. Um, the, the Saudis and the Russians are talking about uh, arms arrangements. So people who used to be antagonistic to each other, either strategically or ideologically, are now much more pragmatic and, and realizing that they need to protect themselves uh, if they can't rely on the U.S. to be their big protector. Um, and, and this is a guess. Nobody knows if the U.S. is going to drop some of these countries. It probably will. Um, and this is what big powers do. Uh, if you go back and look at Somalia in the 1970s and 80s, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, played with Somalia like a ping pong ball. And then they just dropped it and Somalia became the world's first disposable state. It just completely disappeared from the ranks of states. It wasn't collecting statistics. It didn't have functioning government. And it's still in a state of uh, great internal chaos. And, and that might happen in some countries uh, in the Middle East. One of the lessons of the last 30 years is that countries that were thought to be strategically critical, like Iraq, like Syria, like Libya, like Yemen, uh, could in fact be allowed to uh, to collapse into open warfare with international uh, presence and nothing is going to happen that's going to shake the world. Um, that these countries were not actually as strategically important as we once thought they were. And you see it today in Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, uh, Palestine, Lebanon, uh, other places uh, that are in great stress uh, and the world goes on and there's tourism and there's travel and there's uh, uh, cell phone companies being investing, in other words. So all of these relationships are being reevaluated by the local players and the international players. The U.S. remains the single biggest political military actor across the region, but the likelihood is that it is going to reduce its physical presence. So the 100 bases and six, 7,000 troops are likely to be reduced over the next four or five years. And, uh, but it will continue to define or will have to define more clearly what are its actual strategic objectives. So I, at the beginning, I mentioned seven or eight different things. Uh, and the, um, uh, the challenge now for the US is to say, look, these seven or eight different things, we thought they were all strategically important for our well being and security and national security, and they're not so important. Um, so maybe we don't have to have seven different goals. We can have three different goals. Nuclear non-proliferation, um, keep the flow of oil and gas for the whole world, and maybe uh, protect Israel. Even though Israel doesn't need protection, it's stronger than all of the countries in the region. It has 200 nuclear weapons. So the U.S. is going to clearly have to reevaluate its policies. And this brings up the terrible mess uh, which is great for you who are political science students, which is the involvement of domestic political forces in the US. God help any of you who have to analyze the American policy making process in the Middle East in view of domestic political, uh, foreign and local political lobbies in the United States who are trying to influence uh, the government. Uh, it's, it's crazy enough to look at domestic American policies, but when you get into foreign policies, it gets even more complicated, but, th but that's a separate question, which you know, people will have to look at uh, separately. Uh, the, um, the, the main change that I think we're going to witness in the region is going to be the, which has already been pretty much stated, that the U.S. is not going to have as many people in the U.S. and it's in the region in its own basis, but will have an over the horizon uh, capability. That's still a problem over the horizon, meaning it's got foreign close by bases, uh, battleships and cruise missiles that can fire from other places. The problem with that is it's still heavily military defined. Um, and the missing element is uh, how can the U.S. forge a foreign policy for all the countries of the Middle East, the Arabs, Israelis, Turks and Iranians, that actually serves the U.S. well and responds to the reasonable needs of the people of the region. One of the fascinating things is there's a lot of questions, including the you know, title of my talk, is how does the US see the Middle East after Afghanistan? Well, the bigger question that's not asked and really needs to be asked, and it would be great for those of you who study international relations and East Mediterranean things to 
go out and do a study paper on this. The big question is, how does the Middle East see the U.S.? Not how does the U.S. see the Middle East? How do some of the smaller states in the Middle East see the U.S.? Are they afraid that it's going to just drop them um, and let them, you know, perish if they run into trouble and, and just uh, don't worry about them? Because one of the great lessons we've learned is if you have big countries that collapse, like Iraq or Libya, it's not the end of the world, uh, which is a terrible thing, but it's part of the realism of, of, uh, of politics. The other problem the U.S. has is that over the last 30 or 40 years, polling in the region by local and international poll pollsters, credible people, has shown very clearly that the majority of Arabs, and I'm pretty sure Iran is similar, Turkey probably, but not sure, but just for the Arab world, which I know best, the majority of Arabs see the U.S. and Israel as the biggest security threats to their own Arab countries. And this is fascinating. So if the U.S., if the people see the U.S. as a security threat, <clears throat> and the governments of the Arab world see the U.S. as their savior and protector and guardian, uh, clearly there's a tension there, and that tension is playing out in the streets and revolutions and uh, uprisings that are happening, not only because of the foreign policy implications of U.S.-Arab relations, but because of the nature of the link between the U.S. and also uh, Great Britain and France and Russia, foreign powers who support autocratic Arab countries, regimes, and disregard the interests and well-being of the ordinary people, that's what creates the tension, the great pauperization I mentioned, and, the, and there's terrible conditions, I don't have time to get into them, in education, environmental conditions, water, infrastructure, housing, uh, transport, the, and, and medical issues, and, and so many fields of life, uh, life conditions have degraded for a majority of people in the region. And you never hear about this, you never read about it, because it is invisible to the Western media as it is invisible to the American and Russian <clears throat> and British governments as well, unfortunately. But it's an issue that you and I, as educators, uh, should study, because that's what uh, our role is in life is to analyze the world, look at facts, do research, talk to people on both sides, and come up with some real uh, reflection of what the world is really like. So in my last two or three minutes, uh, I just want to say that the, um, the, the Middle East that the U.S. is evolving its policies within, or the, the Middle East within which the U.S. is evolving its policies, <clears throat> Uh, is a Middle East uh, that is suffering far worse conditions in every sector of life than it did 20 or 30, 40 years ago, before the U.S. became such a big military presence in, in the region. So if you look at uh, poverty, uh, corruption, the COVID impact, of course, um, and uh, uh, other factors in um, social and economic and political life, these are almost all due to poor management by lousy governments, criminal governments, irresponsible governments, amateur governments, incompetent governments, uncaring governments, whatever you want to call them. The record of the last 30, 40 years uh, is that the governments of the Arab world have not served their people well. And therefore, the region is much more volatile. And that's why governments are scrambling around looking for people to protect them so, you know, Turkey is taking advantage of this. The Russians are big time taking advantage of this, coming in and making deals with governments. Um, the Iranians are certainly doing it, but the Iranians are not necessarily going to work with governments. They're working with non-governmental organizations. And this is one of the things, the last point I'll make here, <clears throat> is that after the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the rethinking that's almost certainly going on in the United States government's mind, about what it should be doing uh, in the region. Um, what we notice is the region now is a region whose main players include a whole bunch of different actors that are very different than they were 20 and 40 and 50 years ago. So we have some states, some countries that are still pretty intact, like Kuwait or Egypt or Morocco, and Jordan. They're still, you know, pretty. Uh, well, into, uh, well, you know, states with integrity, uh, but they have internal stresses. You have non-state actors, you have big movements, tribal movements, religious movements, political movements uh, that are not 
organized by the states, by the governments, but have their own views. You have armed non-state actors like Hezbollah, like the Houthis, like Hamas, like the popular mobilization forces in Iraq. Some of these non-state armed actors are armed by the United States, like in, in Syria, for instance, in northern Syria. Uh, some of them are armed by Iran. Iran mostly uses non-state actors as its allies in the region. Um, and then you have regional powers, so Turkey, Israel, Iran, uh, UAE, they're the most active ones that are, oh, sorry, that was my cat Goose who wants to come into the show, but Goose is not allowed to uh, join the lecture. So the uh, non-state actors are a huge growing factor. And then you have the regional countries that have a big role to play, and you still have the global powers. The traditional ones, England, France, the US, Russia, and the Chinese now are trying to play uh, a bigger role. Uh, and I'll finish by noting that again, as we look to the future and this evolving situation, the missing element is the ordinary people of this region. 70, 80% of whom are poor and vulnerable and can't meet their weekly food and medical needs. Uh, they don't have any votes. Even the few countries that were showing signs of pluralism and democratic accountability, Tunisia, Lebanon, and Palestine, even under occupation of the Palestinians, um, even those three countries have now started to shut down in terms of their democratic pluralism and, and, and freedoms. So the autocratic hold on the Arab region is almost total now. And therefore, the ordinary people have even less opportunity to not only bring about peaceful change of governments and democratic movements, but they can't even express themselves. If, uh, people are being taken to jail for tweeting things. So it's a very difficult situation. Um, and part of the reason it's difficult is because of the external military actions by many governments, but mainly by the US in recent decades. And hopefully the movement out of Afghanistan will be a turning point where people will realize that, look, we got to find a better way to do this better for the foreign powers like the US, but also better for the people uh, of, of the region. So let me stop there and uh, be happy to hear your thoughts and, and take any questions. Thank you. For Corey. Um, so we can go ahead and take questions. Um, there's no questions in the chat or the Q&A. Oh, um, yes, yeah, so there's no questions so far in the Q&A. So attendees, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them over. Um, I can read them and then we can just go to raise their hands and ask questions. Natalie, um, ask a question. So first of all, thank you. This was very informative and I think we all enjoyed um, your lecture today. I just have one question. So we you talked about the U.S. is defined in the region. Um, do you think in the future the region will have another major power or do you think it will be more like a ground for different major powers that you mentioned like Britain, Russia, China, and still the US as like a battleground for those big powers or will there be like a replacement power in the future? I couldn't hear that. Can somebody repeat the question? Oh, give, give him a mic. <laughs> the question has to do with the decline of US power. Will there be another power that supplants the United States, or will there be a collection or some kind of a confrontation with other powers for sort of like the supremacy of the region? Well, this is fascinating because there are uh, strong debates going on in the region and outside about does this region need one power to control it? Historically, of course, it didn't. I mean, you had it in the history up until the Ottoman empire then after the ottoman empire the modern state system about 100 years ago was created so <clears throat> there wasn't one dominant power the british and the french were a little bit um, in, in control in some areas and then the americans became more involved and then you had the cold war the russians and the, the soviet union the us uh, or soviet union and nato uh, had competition but they, they there was a kind of a, a balance of power uh, between them or among them uh, and of course, they did proxy wars like in Yemen and in other places where they had their, like in Vietnam, you had a proxy war where the big powers didn't fight directly, but they supported local people who fought each other, which is the colonial way to do it. Let the local dark people kill each other and, and then the foreign white guys can just um, hang, hang out and, and watch it happen and 
and sell them arms. Um, so the answer to that question is, um, it's not clear if there's going to be one power that dominates like the US has, um, or whether the region needs a single power to kind of organize. I, I mean, if we're like, if we're truant delinquents and we need somebody to, you know, take care of us, then you could argue that the region needs that. But I don't think that's the, that's the case. The reality, even under the US period of great US control, is that there was huge opposition to the US, heavily led by Iran, uh, at one point the Syrians, at one point the Iraqis, the Libyans, the Palestinians, and others, the Egyptians, way back under Nasser. <clears throat> uh, so there was always people pushing back against uh, the U.S. My guess is that the, it's not going to be possible, uh, nor do we need one hegemonic power. Uh, certainly the foreign powers, the Russians and the Chinese, are not uh, immature enough to and reckless enough like the Americans were to try to dominate the region with their military presence. <clears throat> They're being much more selective in uh, uh, um, identifying openings where they can go in and make deals, either strategic deals like the Russians now have a, a strategic base in Syria with a, a naval base and an air force bases. And so that gives them certain advantages. I don't know why they want a, a military presence in Syria. It's not like they have people in the Middle East trying to invade Russia from the South, but I mean, that's for the Russians to determine. Um, but uh, the people um, abroad are always going to look for little strategic openings where they can have a presence to help them in whatever they feel is in their national w interest, whether it's the Russians see it as strategic links, they then sell nuclear uh, react, not rea you know, power stations, they sell arms, they make money doing things, they have some good technology here and there that they sell. Uh, the Chinese are much more interested in trade and extracting minerals. Uh, they will try to make deals and they're already doing that. They're interested in port arrangements as well. Uh, the British and the French are just kind of lingering from their old colonial days and uh, trying to figure out how they adapt. They haven't adapted uh, very well, um, unfortunately, um, for them. Um, so I don't think you're going to see any one replacement of the U.S., but what you're going to see is a combination of of global powers with niche uh, relationships and regional powers, especially Iran, Turkey, um, maybe the UAE and Saudi Arabia, and and in some ways Israel in very limited ways with the countries with whom Israel has relations like the UAE, for instance, you'll see relationships, economic relationships. So that there's gonna be a much more varied uh, set of power relationships, uh, but I think it, <clears throat> hopefully it'll be much more mutually beneficial to uh, to both sides. But we'll we just have to wait and see. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> Okay, is that better? Yeah, I can hear you, go ahead. Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your time. Sorry, there's an echo here. Or is it better? Okay. Um, so what my question was, should I mute this? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So. I'll try that again. I'd like to thank you for your time and for being here. I really enjoyed the lecture so far. I think the question that you raised like earlier in the lecture with one of the, the important questions coming up is how the Middle East views the U.S. I think that's is what really the question that you raised earlier in the lecture with how the Middle East views the U.S. rather than focusing yes. on how the U.S. views the Middle East. I was just wondering if you have any like guesses or anything about how different states within the Middle East or different Arab states are now viewing kind of pressure from outside um, countries and how they're going to handle relationships with other countries going forward and if there's going to be any change in that? Well, the situation, situation now in the conditions that I described where not a single Arab country is democratic, um, Iran and Turkey um, have unusual political systems, but neither of which I think are 100% 
uh, democratic, and Israel uh, has a peculiar political system which is rather colonial and therefore serves the interests of the of the Jewish majority, but is not in, uh, serving uh, all the citizens and the people it occupies. So none of these none of these uh, countries in the region um, create relationships with or the governments and the countries in the region create relationships with foreign powers based all of them do it purely on the basis of what the rulers of those countries feel is in their best interest uh, and not so much uh, with only a few exceptions here and there not they don't really consider what ordinary people feel and that's why as i mentioned the the polling evidence is is very clear that the majorities in most arab countries not every one of them but most of them uh, see the U.S. and Israel as their main security threat. They also see others. Some people see Iran as a threat. Some people see um, Russia as a threat. But the U.S. and Israel are the plurality. They're the biggest one. Um, and therefore, there is this constant tension between ordinary people's views of foreign powers, especially the U.S., and the government's views of those same foreign powers. Many of these countries if you take Jordan, for an example, which I know well because I'm a Jordanian citizen, um, and I lived there for many years, and that um, I'm Palestinian, but I'm, I have a, I'm also a Jordanian citizen, uh, that in Jordan there's a strong uh, criticism of the U.S., strong criticism of Israel, but the government of Jordan has a peace treaty with Israel, which it maintains, and they believe it's for the best interests of the country, uh, and many people support that, but there's always tensions, so there's always parliamentary moves to try to throw out the Israeli ambassador and, and the government and the king overcome that through various um, uh, uh, smoke and mirror tricks that they use in parliament. And therefore the tension is always there between popular sentiment to foreign powers and official government sentiment to foreign powers. This is the problem of uh, a lack of democracy and um, it's gonna be there forever until these systems evolve uh, somehow, uh, and nobody knows when or how that's going to happen. The current uprisings that are still going on are um, uh, promising in many ways, but none of them have really broken through to a, to a democratic system. And the one that did, Tunisia, uh, in the last three months has suffered a terrible reversal where the president suddenly closed parliament and closed the government and said he's going to rewrite the constitution. And, and has done what Arab autocrats have done for the last 50, 60 years, which is take the control of the executive, the judiciary, um, and the legislature, and rewrite the constitution and have the military support them, and be supported by foreign powers, who will tell you that we are, you know, the US or Britain or France, who so will support the Tunisian government and say this is for the uh, uh, well-being of the Tunisian people and security in the region or something like that. So this is a, this is a real problem. Um, and I think it's something worth exploring for those of you who are interested in international, uh, international relations. The views of ordinary people uh, um, and the views of governments and, and why they often don't mesh together very well. By the way, if you're interested in that, you might take a look in the U.S. itself about, say, views towards the Arab-Israeli conflict, where in the U.S. now you're getting a significant, slow, gradual evolution of public sentiment, including among young Jewish Americans who are increasingly saying that the U.S. should take an even-handed position, be support the Palestinians, support the Israelis, peace for both people, living peacefully side by side. Before, it used to be 90% said Israel was right, we give Israel what it wants, the Palestinians uh, don't deserve anything, they're all uh, terrorists or whatever. That's changing significantly. So the, the, again, you're seeing an evolution in the U.S. because it is a predominantly mostly democratic country, you have ways whereby people can mobilize and organize, they can vote. So you get some of these progressive Democrats in Congress now who are taking very strong positions for an even-handed uh, U.S. policy. And there you're seeing how the differences between popular sentiment and uh, government uh, sentiment uh, evolves and, and, and the relationships within them. So these things that we talk, you know, we talk about the Middle East like it's a strange, weird place uh, 
with all these things going on. Well, the exact same thing is happening inside uh, inside the United States, and you and you can just walk around Boston and do a poll and find out similar perceptions about any issue: um, Middle East stuff, immigration, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Me Too, climate change, vaccination. Pick any issue you want, and you're going to find uh, a wide variety of views. The democratic states have a mechanism to peacefully resolve those differences and come up with policies that are implemented. Um, and if the population doesn't like it, they change the government in the next election. Uh, we don't have those uh, privileges yet in the in the Arab region, and hopefully we will one day soon. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Very comprehensive. I mean, I just, I don't know where to, to pick from, but you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by your last comments because when, when you study Latin America, for the most part, uh, there's a, all this language and all this literature on de democratization, uh, tra transitions to democracy, authoritarianism, all kinds of like comparative politics stuff. And when we study the Eastern Mediterranean or the Middle East, it's all geopolitics. Yes. Right? So now it's, it's a reversal kind of thing. So like over the last 40 years, and I was very fascinated by the fact that you focus on the people, so you make the distinction between those nice squares that we see in international relations and the people and the mechani mechanisms of governance that we see in comparative politics sort of thing. So I think it's sort of like an evolutionary process now. This part of the world is becoming a focus of political development, which is sort of like a fascinating thing to, to watch. And from my perspective, and I want your, your, your feedback on that, is like, this is a 40 year process. I would go back to the rise of political Islam in, in Iran, right? And we've seen this process now take on, and as the US is sort of like retreating its chessboard perspective of the world, in that part of the world, there are all kinds of movements now being festered. So, you're seeing all these states that seem to be completely gone. They're like, you can draw a chart in the Arab world of fragility to failure, and they're all there. Like, you know, Yemen, or I mean, I don't even know how Lebanon is a country anymore. I mean, it's just like, it's an amazing thing, right? Uh, or yeah. Libya, or Iraq, or Syria. I mean, we're talking about states that in the 1950s, if you thought that they would just be completely gone, you'd say, uh, you know, not, not possible. Yet we're seeing this. It might seem something that, you know, just out of the blue, or is it something that you're also seeing as well as far as the evolutionary process? No, it's definitely correct. Uh, there is an evolutionary process. Uh, it does go in waves. Um, there were huge attempts across the whole Arab world in the last 40, 50 years that I've lived through and experienced and been involved in, where people were trying, ordinary people were trying to push their governments on human rights, on pluralism, on the rule of law, on an independent judiciary, free media. People tried all kinds of things, uh, trade unions, uh, but the ruling elite at the top simply wouldn't budge. And the reason they wouldn't budge is because they felt that they were protected by their foreign patrons, uh, in many cases, the US, England, France, or Russia, and recently, uh, Iran. Um, and these uh, ruling elites uh, just held their ground uh, and, and wouldn't budge. That's why you had in the last 10 years all these um, uprisings, um, uh, Arab Spring, as they're often called in the West, but the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, and the last 10 years, nonstop uprisings, and in four countries, in Sudan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Algeria, the uprisings continue. They've been going on for two years nonstop, even with uh, the pandemic. Uh, and this is totally unreported in the Western world because the Arab people are invisible people. They don't exist. They're like black people in the US in 1940. They just don't exist. They're there, but you don't see them. You don't recognize them. Um, they live in their own universe. Uh, they don't live according to your rules. Uh, and the, um, the reality is that uh, the conditions of societies and states, and especially at family and community level, have deteriorated so badly in recent years that these people had to finally just take to the streets uh, and try to overthrow their systems. And even then they couldn't do it because the governments were so uh, 
heavily protected and supported and funded and armed and trained by uh, foreign powers in most cases. Um, and therefore, um, the, the question to me becomes not just what are the views of citizens, what are the views of state, of governments, the question becomes, is, and you talked about the frag fragmenting to, to failed states, the state itself, the, the system of countries, sovereign countries, is really what is now up in the air. Uh, so I, 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 trying to be cute, I, I would say that the problem of the Arab, the modern Arab state is the modern Arab state. The state itself simply hasn't functioned very well for most people for most of the time. Uh, there was a period from the 40s to the 70s when Arab states were developing really quite nicely. But um, in the last 40 years, it's been pretty much, like I said, downhill. And I've written about this, and I'm happy to send you articles if you want to look at some of these uh, trajectories. Uh, so the state itself is, a, is an issue because it isn't able to respond to its people's rights and needs for dignified, decent life. Uh, it isn't able to protect its state from foreign militarism. It isn't able to give its citizens opportunities and voice. And therefore, many citizens said, hell, if the state doesn't treat me well, I don't want this state. And that's why you have groups like Hezbollah and the Houthis and Muslim Brothers. And then the, the, a bunch of extremists create a whole new state, the Islamic State, they called it. Uh, so the, the, the state itself is a fragile entity in the modern Arab state system. And, and, and many of the states that now look like they're wealthy and strong, especially the oil ones, may not be in such good shape a few years down the road when if oil prices continue to stagnate or decline and alternate energy takes over. We'll have to see what happens to these, uh, uh, these countries. Um, but the whole region is in a state of, let's call it, um, some of them are in turmoil, but most of them are in transformation turbulence um, and uh, there's a lot of movement and that's why you've got powers in the region uh, regional powers trying to grab their share of whatever they want and foreign powers are looking for niche roles to to play but it's a very dynamic um, system and uh, everything is moving at once and we just it's impossible to try to to predict what's going to happen if you read any American newspaper columnist or television commentator who's going to tell you about the future of the Arab world immediately switch over to the most available football or baseball game and watch that because that's going to be a lot more accurate than any ridiculous uh, uh, prognosis that people here try to tell you about what's going to happen uh, in the Middle East. Uh, but it's, uh, it's an important situation. The region remains strategically significant for various uh, reasons and the biggest recent reason, which is takes us back to where we started, the U.S. military going to Afghanistan. The biggest reason problem is, of course, terrorism, which is a threat to the whole world, mostly to the Middle East itself, where tens of thousands of people have died because of terrorism and bombing. And um, uh, but terrorism and the related issue of uh, warfare that leads to mass illegal migration which threatens Europe more than the US. Uh, but so these issues, there's new threats and dangers that come out of the Middle East. And, and the, the region uh, is strategically important for transport and, uh, and other issues. At the same time, it's a real uh, prize to be won. The, the assets of the Middle East, if you have a stable Middle East with, with reasonably democratic, you don't have to have perfect democracies, but have a you know, stable government where people are not mistreated and they can get on with their economic activity and their social cultural creativity. Uh, if the Middle East were to develop and you resolve the Iran nuclear issue, you resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict, both of which are easily resolvable in my view, this region can be an extraordinary driver of economic growth and cultural development across much of the um, um, uh, southern part of the world, and certainly in the Asian, African, uh, Middle Eastern part of the uh, of the world, because of the of the cultural links that uh, that there are. So there's there's many things that need to be looked at in the Middle East, uh, other than just Sun Sunnis and Shiites or Arabs and Israelis, um, and and the American forces coming to the region with their firepower have aggravated the region as have 
Russian forces and others, but the Americans were the biggest uh, problem in this sense. And now that after Afghanistan, the US may be reconsidering its role and its military role, uh, that's a positive thing. Uh, and, and you want engagement between the US and England and France and Russia and Iran, Turkey with the Arab, you, we want that engagement. It's for the benefit uh, of everybody. Uh, if it's done on a on a peaceful basis, not on a colonial uh, basis, so let's hope uh, for that, and uh, we'll uh, find out in the next uh, next ten fifteen years. Yeah. Hopefully, we're here to, uh, to find out in the next ten fifteen years. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I like your, your comment as far as the, uh, the the modern state. I mean, I have long advocated that the, the we're witnessing is that is a failure of the modernization project of the West in in the Arab world and that's what we're seeing playing itself out right now and I you know I, I like your optimistic ending but I slightly disagree in the fact that I think the problem of the Middle East is its geopolitical importance and that is its curse as well so all of those things could be solved but in some ways they're not solved because it serves different purposes because of its geopolitical importance so if you want to solve the Middle East you make it geopolitically unimportant and you let the powers that be regionally take care of themselves. Yeah, well, we'll uh, we will see what happens. And uh, make thank it, you. Make it thank the Iberian Peninsula. <laughs> <So> yeah. <doesn't laughs> thank you for having me. I enjoyed thank it, you. and I look forward to visiting you in person one day. Uh, absolutely.